Good afternoon. My name is Robert Trewartha. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications and Initiatives with the City of Mississauga and your moderator for this afternoon's information session. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the lands which constitute the present day City of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and Wyandotte Nations. We recognize these people and their ancestors as people who inhabited these lands since time immemorial. The city of Mississauga is home to many global indigenous peoples. As a municipality, the city of Mississauga is actively working towards reconciliation by confronting our past and our present, providing space for indigenous peoples within their territory to recognize and uphold their treaty rights and to support indigenous peoples. We formerly recognize the Anishinaabe origins of our name and continue to make Mississauga a safe space for all indigenous peoples. Today, we are pleased to be joined by Madam Mayor Crombie, as well as Councillor Stephen Dasko, as well as our senior leadership team, including our CAO, Paul Mitchum, and commissioners are present, and they are available to answer questions later in the program. I will now take a few moments to review our agenda and walk through some of the logistics for this afternoon's session. We'll begin with remarks and presentation from Mayor Bonnie Crombie on our election priorities as a city. We'll then devote the rest of our time to question and answer session to provide our local provincial candidates and residents with an opportunity to ask us questions. Thank you to the candidates who confirmed they would be joining us this afternoon. And Aaron Mills, Michelle Angaska, Green Party, Imran Meehan, Ontario Liberal Party, Charles Rob um, Robleski, New Blue, Farina Hassan, NDP, in Mississauga Center, Adrian Franklin, Green Party, Sumira Malik, Ontario Liberal Party, Audrey Simpson, New Blue, Greg Vesna, None of the Above Party, Sarah Walji, NDP, and Deepika Demerla, Liberal Party. In Mississauga Malton, we have Wasim Ahmed, NDP. In Mississauga East Cooksville, James He, Green Party of Ontario, and Gregory Tomchishin, Ontario Party. And in Mississauga Lakeshore, we have David Zenny, Green Party, Brian Crombie, None of the Above Party, and Julia Cole, NDP. And finally, in Mississauga Streetsville, we have Jill Promoli, the Ontario Liberal Party, Len Little, None of the Above Party, and Nina Tangri, Progressive Conservative Party. Now on to logistics. As we are meeting virtually, the way to ask questions depends on how you join today's meeting. Candidates who are joining us as panelists this afternoon will have a chance to ask questions uh, of the mayor and staff. You may do so by raising your virtual hand during the Q&A session and wait until you are called upon. I stress that this is not a debate or a place for lengthy speeches. It's an opportunity for information and an opportunity for you to ask questions. Given our time constraints, I would ask you to limit preambles and I would ask you to keep your questions focused on the material that will be presented today. If you are registered and participating on WebEx, we encourage you to type your question in the chat at any time during the meeting. And if you're watching the live stream, please send your questions via email to mississaugamatters at mississauga.ca. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. However, if we don't get to your question, we will be posting the answers to the outstanding questions on mississaugamatters.ca following the event. And finally, please note that today's session is being recorded. The recording will be posted on our mississaugamatters.ca website following the event. And with that, I'd now like to turn it over to Mayor Bonnie Crombie for opening remarks and a presentation on the city's priorities. Madam Mayor, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this, what will be, I hope, a very informative session for you. Welcome to all the candidates on the call today. I respect that you want to be briefed on the city's priorities, um, especially today as you are in the midst of your campaigning. So we want to thank the councillors who were able to join me today as well, and I think I see Councillor Stephen Dasko from Ward 1. Stephen, I just give a wave to everyone, One, say a brief hello. If you want to unmute, say a quick hello. Thanks for joining us and uh, thanks for having me here, Madam Mayor. Perfect. Thank you. So along with our city manager, Paul Mitchum, and many members of our leadership team, all here able to answer questions should the need arise, I'm going to walk you through Mississauga's top priorities ahead of June 2nd, and then we'll open it up to questions from both the candidates, uh, from all of the candidates, and those on the, or any of you on the call that want to get in a little deeper. Slide two, please. Okay. Ahead of the provincial election in just under three weeks, our city's top priorities can be sorted out into four broad buckets. Housing affordability, 
investment in public transit, funding for cities, and targeted support for our local businesses. Let me say to you that these are common as well to all the Ontario big city mayors, but I will get into some of the nitty gritty on Mississauga, Mississauga's specific asks. Okay, so Mississauga, like most cities in Ontario, is facing a housing affordability crisis. Many people are being priced out of the market while and while the city is taking action to address this crisis, we don't have the fiscal fire prior, excuse me, fiscal firepower that the province and the federal government have, which is why coordination and collaboration on this issue is so important. Not one level of government can solve this problem. All three must work together. Safe and affordable housing is the foundation of our economy, our quality of life, and the future we build for the next generation. People should be able to afford to live and to work in Mississauga. Prices are out of reach for 80% of households in Mississauga. The average cost of any housing unit in our city is $1.1 million and even higher for a detached single family home with an average price of around $1.8 million. The average rent also continues to rise with the average rental price in our city being $1,569 per month, far out of reach for many. And Mississauga will only continue to grow, which is why it is so important that we address this issue now. The province estimates through their growth plan that Mississauga will grow by 250,000 residents over the next 30 years. We will be a city of almost 1 million people by 2050. A one size fits all solution will not work. All three levels of government and the private sector must work together. Council and staff continue to work closely with developers to remove barriers to development and approve more housing. Our housing projects are approved within 90% of the allotted time frame, and we're very proud of that. We also have a plan in place to build more middle income housing for Mississaugans and have made significant progress in our efforts by securing affordable units in new developments, by negotiating with developers and implementing inclusionary zoning. Simplifying the process for second units, such as basement apartments or in law suites. Protecting the supply of rental housing by protecting existing rentals from demolition or conversion to condominium without a permit. Making surplus lands available to affordable housing providers first and much more. Mississauga is approving more housing units than required to meet the annual demand. We're processing applications more quickly than surrounding municipalities, and we're meeting the time frame for approval, as I said before, 95% of the time. We have 60,000 permits approved or pre-approved right now, and that is 20,000 units where developers can pull that permit anytime, and another 40,000 that are as of right and can be built. We also regularly meet or exceed approval targets for permit applications. The, model, the bottleneck is not at the municipal level. But we're not done yet. We continue to explore new and innovative ways to make housing more affordable by implementing inclusionary zoning to achieve affordable units in new construction, working to incentivize more affordable rental housing, and looking for ways to increase housing options such as laneway housing, garden suites, garage conversions, duplexes, townhomes, stacked townhomes, etc. Reimagining our malls, eliminating a lot of that asphalt and parking lot around those malls, examining ways to develop housing cooperatives and community land trusts, supporting the vacant home tax being proposed by the region of Peel. Provincial legislation, the More Choices for Everyone Act, was recently passed by the province in an attempt to address the housing affordability crisis. And we have raised some concerns with the plan and hope that the next government is receptive to our feedback and open to making the changes needed to make this legislation work for cities. 
my office and council have worked with the city staff to prepare detailed responses to all of the proposed changes in the Act. We need the next Ontario government to be our partner, to make housing more affordable and to build more of it together. We have proposed many solutions, such as introducing funding for affordable housing developers, providing support for first-time home buyers, such as assistance with closing costs, giving municipalities the power to zone for residential rental buildings and offer incentives to build it, HST rebates and other tax incentive policies, and much, much more. We are focused on working with the next provincial government to make small changes to legislation and policy that could make a big difference, like permitting inclusionary zoning everywhere that the market can support it, and permit cash in lieu of inclusionary zoning, requiring a minimum of 20% of, of affordable units to be provided when selling surplus land to developers, discouraging investor-owned real estate, a residential real estate, through tools like capital gains tax, while excluding residence, principal residences, and improvements to the provincial non-residence speculation tax. Mississauga continues to make significant investments in public transit locally, but we require additional investment from the provincial and the federal governments to meet our long-term transit goals. It's critical that we focus on building a regionally integrated transit network that will link us to our neighbours. And remember, we are a net importer of jobs, making transit even more essential as our city continues to grow, more affordable housing, and reduce congestion and emissions while still growing as a community. Mississauga requires investment in critical transit infrastructure and services in order to meet our economic development goals. This is especially important in the coming years as all three levels of government work to recover and regain our economic losses and create jobs. Mississauga is home to nearly 800,000 residents and 94,000 businesses. That includes almost 75 Fortune 500 companies and 1,400 multinationals. That makes us the seventh largest city in the country and an economic powerhouse in Ontario. But as we continue to grow at a rapid pace, we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to support that growth. We have a plan to move people throughout our city and beyond to fuel that engine but we require a committed provincial partner to support our most important transit projects, namely all day two-way service on the Milton Go Line and building the downtown loop on the Hazel McCallion LRT. The Milton Go Rail Corridor is a key local and regional rapid transit corridor that is the second business busiest corridor in the GO Transit Network, serving over 20,000 passengers per day, six stations, and over 70,000 jobs in Mississauga. However, despite all this, all-day two-way GO service on the Milton Corridor has not been committed to by the province. We currently have employers in Mississauga who can see the GO Train station from in Meadowvale or in Streetsville from their offices, but can't get their employees to commute in to Mississauga on the trains because they're running in the wrong direction at the wrong time. In from Milton to Toronto in the morning rush hour and back to Toronto, back out of, sorry, back out of Toronto to Milton through Mississauga during the evening rush hour. The train basically runs the wrong direction, not allowing people from Toronto to come to their employment in Mississauga. All-day two-way service would encourage development along the transit corridor while also reducing congestion. The good news is that the federal government has recently announced support for increased service on the Milton Go Line of up to $1 billion. We appreciate these investments, but in order to make all-day service a reality, we also need the next provincial government to invest and work in lockstep with the federal government to make it happen. 
our residents and our businesses depend on it. In March of 2019, the Ontario government announced scope changes to the project that removed a key component of the Huron Ontario LRT, namely the downtown loop. In order, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to help the city realize our full economic potential, the downtown in the downtown area, the downtown loop must be considered a funding priority. When complete, the Here Ontario LRT will connect over 32 million people a year to Mississauga and beyond. Thousands of jobs and businesses and housing units are located along the Here Ontario corridor, and those numbers are constantly increasing as our downtown continues to develop into a thriving economic centre within the GTA. Both the Liberals and the NDP have committed in their platforms to building the loop if elected. When he was Premier, Doug Ford said publicly that he wanted to restore the downtown loop, and while it wasn't in the recent Ontario budget, if re-elected, I would strongly encourage him to get this done. The good news is that from an engineering perspective, the loop can be added seamlessly to the project at any time. Ontario has faced the longest and most widespread public health measures in all of North America. These lockdowns have put an unprecedented strain on municipal revenues. Despite our council taking decisive action and implementing implementing measures, including temporary hiring freezes, reducing discretionary costs, and deferral of capital projects, the city continues to face a year-end deficit from COVID-19. And significant advocacy throughout the pandemic, um, after, after the advocacy, the federal and the provincial governments developed the Safe Restart Program which provided funding to municipalities in Ontario, including a $156 million for the city of Mississauga to offset lost revenues to ensure municipalities could continue to provide critical services and programs to our residents. We are thankful for that funding, but like other municipalities, we'll face the lingering effects of this pandemic for many years to come. The fact is, we still need help. The city of Mississauga continues to face a revenue shortfall. The two main drivers are decreased transit ridership and reduced payments in lieu of taxes, we call them the PILTs, paid by Pearson International Airport due to reduced air travel. The PILTs are payments made by government organizations, including Pearson, to other governments in lieu of property taxes. The city is forecasting a 2022 revenue shortfall of $50 million, 8% of the city's operating budget. And of that, $22 million is attributed to transit and $21 million to the PILTs, or lack thereof. In addition, the city is projecting a $45 million deficit in 2023, of which $11 million is attributed to transit and $25 million is attributed to the PILTs. MyWay, our, our bus transit network, is Ontario's third largest municipal transit service provider with 507 buses, of which 41 are hybrid electric and is an affordable and accessible and seamless method for commuters to travel into Mississauga from other municipalities and region for work or to study. The pandemic has had a devastating effect on transit ridership, with forecasts indicating that ridership <clears throat> will still be at only 68% of pre-pandemic levels by the end of 2022. In addition, MyWay has had to suspend a number of routes, putting further strain on some of Mississauga's most vulnerable populations by reducing their access to transit and these are essential workers. Affordable transit allows commuters to travel into Mississauga from other regions, such as Toronto, to work or to study. 
The Greater Toronto Airport Authority, GTAA, has paid the city of Mississauga Pilts since 2001 based on a per passenger rate capped at 5% per year. During COVID, Ontario temporarily suspended the existing 5% cap, which allows Pilts to raise at the same rate as passenger growth until air travel ridership reaches pre-pandemic levels, after which the 5% cap will be put back in place, sadly. While helpful, passenger activity has decreased by 74% at Pearson, drastically reducing Mississauga's revenue. To address these shortfalls, our city will be forced to either reduce services or use funding reserves, which will require a tax increase to replenish. Mississauga cannot maintain or grow its infrastructure on local taxes alone, by property taxes. To continue to build Mississauga into a world-class city, we need long-term, predictable and sustainable funding models for infrastructure renewal projects. This will ensure sufficient time and resources to allow us to properly manage these projects and focus on local priorities. Mississauga has an estimated $13.6 billion worth of infrastructure assets, including $3.1 billion in roads, $5.3 billion in stormwater systems, and $973 million in bridges. Cities receive only nine cents of every tax dollar collected by governments in Canada, but are responsible for 60 cents of every dollar spent on infrastructure, as we own 60% of the infrastructure. The math just doesn't add up. The city's current funding does not fully support all capital requirements. And as a result, the condition of some of our assets is starting to decline. And the cost of repairs and replacement will only increase as time passes. With an average of annual infrastructure gap, that's our infrastructure deficit, of about 40 to $45 million, the city continues to face even larger funding shortfalls. Historically, we have managed because of our financial strength and the policies that Council has adopted over the years, including a 2% infrastructure levy. While the 2% infrastructure and debt repayment levy helps slow how quickly the infrastructure gap is expanding, additional funding from other levels of government is required. As provincial and federal governments assist the municipal sector, they must also continue to help our business community. While Mississauga has and will continue to play an ongoing role in helping our local businesses, especially those hardest hit, we need an active and engaged provincial and federal partner to work with us to build back better through a whole community approach that leaves no one behind. Mississauga's Main Street businesses form the core of our economy. Our over 94,000 small businesses represent nearly half of all employment across our city, and they are the ones who have been hardest hit by the impacts of the pandemic. Their long-term prosperity is directly tied to the identity and economic health of our communities. And without continued support from the province to spur their recovery, the long-term vitality of our city is at risk. This is a problem made worse by the disproportionate impact of COVID on tourism and the culture industries, and by extension of the air transportation sector, both of which make up a large proportion of jobs in Mississauga as we are home to Pearson International Airport, or as we like to call it, the Mississauga International Airport. These are larger problems that Mississauga cannot solve on its own. Though we have done everything we can at the local level to blunt the impact of the pandemic on our local economy. We are grateful for the provincial support that we have received so far, but need additional, more stable commitments to ensure a smooth recovery. While the Digital Main Street program has been highly successful and well received by our small business community, short funding envelopes of six months have made it difficult for Mississauga's Business Enterprise Centre to attract and retain 
qualified staff to provide digital advisory services to businesses. Additionally, despite the growing importance and benefits of adopting sustainable advanced technologies, including automation and low carbon technologies, business adoption levels remains low. Local businesses have identified high costs and uncertainty with regards to appropriate and effective, cost-effective technologies as barriers to adoption, which could be addressed through an expansion of existing provincial programs. Access to talent continues to be the primary concern for employers across industries. Recent employer surveys estimate between 40 and 60% of employers have experienced limits to growth and business opportunities due to skill shortages. While recent provincial policy shifts support flexible, lifelong learning, as well as the supports for work integrated learning opportunities, including internships, have been welcomed by industry stakeholders, more is needed. More input is needed from industry stakeholders in order to ensure that supports are tailored to existing and future job opportunities. The need for industry input is particularly critical within Ontario's high value growth industries that are relied upon to drive our overall prosperity. Further, small and medium sized businesses who often cannot afford dedicated human resource staff required to compete in today's tight labor market, face unique challenges in accessing existing programs, as well as recruiting and retaining employees. A recent Business Development Bank of Canada survey found that 77% of entrepreneurs have reported having no formal hiring process and 63% have no dedicated human resource staff. Disruptions from the COVID pandemic have amplified underlying challenges within the job market and have made it harder for those traditionally facing challenges to employment in finding long-term and stable work. These disruptions are leading to well-documented skills mismatch and a vicious cycle of exclusion from job opportunities, valuable work experience and skill development. Addressing labor mismatches and fully incorporating underemployment populations in Canada could add over 2 million workers to Canada's labor force. This is a problem that we're seeing at the local level. Additional provincial incentives and programs to encourage the under and unemployed population to find gainful employment could help jumpstart uh, our local economy. Mississauga is a great place to work, to live, and to play because of the investments that we have made in our community. But we, like so many municipalities across the country, have been dealt a very difficult hand because of the pandemic. Partnerships and collaboration are exactly what will help us move into a robust recovery, which is why we've held today's session and are committed to establishing a close working relationship with the next provincial government. I know that was a lot of information, but we're a large city and there's a lot on the go. And I think this is the perfect segue to opening it up to questions from you, our local candidates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Crombie. We will now open the floor to questions, as you said, from both our candidates and residents. As a reminder, you may ask a question on the Q&A tool on WebEx or by sending an email to Mississauga Matters at mississauga.ca. Uh, if you don't have your question answered today, we will uh, post the answers uh, on mississaugamatters.ca following the session. We also invite all the registered candidates who are on as panelists uh, to raise their virtual hand. It's on the bottom bar of your WebEx screen uh, so that you can uh, be, uh, so that we can have your question asked and answered. Uh, so I'm just going to look down at the bar at the moment and see, does anybody, any one of the candidates have their hands up so far? I see Wasim Ahmed first, and then we will go to uh, Gregory Tom Shishin. Uh, Wasim, go ahead. Wasim, I think you're on mute. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, Mayor Bani Krambi, for arranging this uh, you know session. Uh, we get to know uh, in detail from you what is required in the city of Mississauga, the city where we call it home. We love the city. Uh, you know, we live here. We uh, have multiple businesses in the city, uh, so I understand the issues and uh, you know concerns we have. Uh, we also, uh, whenever we meet, we always discuss about the issues what we face in terms of residents as well as the Mississauga business owners. Uh, you know, you have already said in your presentation the things what you're looking for in terms of the NDP commitment. As you all know, I'm Ms. Saga Malton NDP candidate. Uh, you know, uh, are you, I'm sure what commitments you're looking for specifically from us, uh, we will be there to work with you uh, if I get elected. Uh, you know, especially uh, I'm in Malton area, it's a long issue which people have been talking about in terms of the bypass uh, for the, uh, you know, the train. Uh, you know, what we can do from the provincial side to work with the uh, city of Mississauga to make sure that happens. Uh, you know, when I've been knocking these doors, uh, you know, in the Malton area for months, people have said, like, you know, many, many times in the past, this have been ignored. And you have been a counselor for Mississauga Malton. You know, this issue has been occurring for a long time. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is one question I have, you know, where we can work together. And the second one is, uh, you know, uh, a long-term care or uh, a senior's home for ethnic minority. As you know, uh, Mississauga, especially the Saga Malton area, has a lot of, uh, you know, ethnic minorities, uh, you know, especially uh, the Muslim community as well as the Sikh community, uh, you know, uh, in partnership with City of Saga, where we can, uh, you know, have uh, seniors' home for uh, ethnic minorities, you know, we'll be glad to, uh, you know, see where we can work together. Thank you. Uh, Wasim, thank you for those questions. There's, they are excellent questions. And let me first address the Goreway Bridge. I know it well. Um, and certainly, once the Torbrum Road Bridge uh, is completed, we will begin on um, the Goreway Bridge. We have had a few difficulties from uh, an infrastructure standpoint uh, on Torbrum, but of course, we can't have both bridges being in construction at the same time. So once that one is completed, we will move on to the Goreway Bridge, as you can well imagine. Uh, and then and I will address your uh, question on LTCs and ethnic minority groups. But first, I'd like to give an opportunity to our Commissioner of Transportation and Works, uh, Jeff Wright, I think I just promoted him, uh, uh, to speak about what uh, specifics on the on the Goreway Bridge project. Jeff, are you on the call? And can you address this as well, please? Thanks, Madam Mayor. And so, uh, Wasim, your question on the Goreway Bridge project. Uh, yeah, the project is moving forward. Um, it is a project that's being led by the uh, City of Brampton. The City of Mississauga is funding a portion of the bridge. There are two other stakeholders, uh, Canadian National Ra Railway and the region of Peel. Uh, there were a number, as Mayor Crombie mentioned, there the, we were wrapping up the Torburn Road grade separations project. And now that that is uh, at its completion state, there are a few other agreements that we need to get in place that are just wrapping up. And we hope to go out to tender and start construction on that project later this fall. So uh, we are working very closely with the current ward councillor uh, to ensure that residents are kept up to date and the project does move forward. So I hope that answers your questions on timing. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mayor Crombie. Yeah, you know, it is a project as well. Wasim, as you would know, that is very close to my heart. I served the council as a councillor up in that area previously and, and now mayor for the whole city, but it is a project I'm very passionate about and I watch the progress very closely. The second question was on LTCs and ethnic minorities and what sort of assistance can be provided. And this is another issue as our population ages and and here at city council we're always looking at our programs and services with a lens to do they support our older populations and certainly we have heard from many many communities on uh, the the uh, appropriateness and, and effectiveness of having that right um, you know a building ethnic specific, shall we call it, uh, long-term care facilities where it, their language, their home language is spoken, food is served, et cetera. And we agree, those are all wonderful things. And we'd like to work with the provincial government. So should there be surplus land, that land could be sold below market value rates. Um, and we, this certainly our council um, will provide assistance with 
potential grants of development charges so that we can build uh, long-term care facilities um, more easily. Um, you know, our council asked uh, for uh, that the MZO on the Andy Bathgate lands over at 403 in Eglinton, that that be sold at less than affordable, less, excuse me, less than market value so that affordable housing or long-term care facilities uh, could be could be built there. And we are doing so in other areas as well. Unfortunately, we were not successful, but we're still working with the development community and the provincial government to ensure that more long-term care is built. Uh, there are a number of communities that have come forward to build, uh, let's call it ethnic specific long-term care. Um, and as well, our Trillium Health Partners is in the midst of, of uh, building on Speakman. Uh, I believe it's almost 400 beds if can someone correct me if I'm wrong? 600 beds over on Speakman, long-term care facilities. I know that the, the Coptic community has stepped up and asked for uh, a development of long-term care facility. The Ukrainian Ivan Franco home is expanding. So we see right across the city that these are the kinds of long-term care facilities that are being proposed. Um, land is an issue. The cost of land is an issue. Um, and, you know, the community is doing quite a bit of fundraising to be engaged. So uh, we, we are working very closely with any community that comes forward that wants to build long-term care. We, we know the need and uh, we're working with our partners at the provincial government to make a reality. I hope that helps answer your question. But of course, we will do whatever we can at the municipal level to make it easier. Sure. Thank you so much. And, you know, as I said again, if I get elected, I will do my best from the provincial side to work with the city of Mississauga to make those priorities as our priorities. Thank you very much, Wasim. Uh, moving on, we will go to Gregory Tom Titian. Uh, and then to Charles, and then to James. Uh, go ahead, Gregory. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Gregory Tom Chishin. I'm the Ontario Party candidate from Mississauga East Cooksville. And I've actually heard a lot about what the city has to do. And I really, if I am elected, I will be working hard to get some things going because like with the public transit there, with the getting Milton line, more service and whatnot going that's something i wish that happened a lot often when i was growing up and i see that's a key thing i do have a few questions though regarding i guess the city and trying to get more people employed and whatnot and also like being a young person myself there's like i've noticed a lot of places in the city people looking to hire other people in and i have about two questions in concern about that first i'm wondering will the city be dedicated to removing all i guess you know, COVID and pandemic related measures in regards to hiring people. So like regardless of people's vaccination status, they can get equal opportunity to accessing jobs and getting to work in the city. So employers can hire in people that are very well talented and skilled for their abilities without having to worry that, you know, those people will be kicked out based on their own personal free medical private decision. And on top of that as well, is there anything the city is going to do to help, I guess, a lot of young people who feel like they don't have the skills or the abilities needed, especially freshly graduated out of university and even in high school in some cases, to you know get those entry level jobs that are needed to get into the more advanced professions, whatnot, and get the foot in the door into the working world. Those are excellent questions. I really want to thank you. And I am going to uh, attempt to answer them right now. And then I'm also going to ask uh, our Commissioner of uh, Financial Services and our City Manager, Paul Mitchum, to add to my comments. So uh, as you know, we have a very diverse city and we're blessed have so many people from 150 com countries that speak 200 languages and come to Canada and to Mississauga as a place to live, work, and invest, and have skill sets and speak multiple languages and bring their uh, bring their training and their skills. And I truly feel that. Uh, even the employees at City Hall should reflect the demographics of our community, and we have made that a priority. However, we also hire based on merit and on qualifications. We must do so. We are stewards of your money, uh, of municipal taxpayers' funding, uh, and so we we only hire based on qualifications and merit. Uh, but we 
we do give everyone an opportunity. We made it a priority to ensure that job postings are posted in places where people uh, with accessibility issues and or from diverse communities have the opportunity to see those postings. So I will um, let me just comment about entry level jobs. I will let our city manager speak about entry level positions. Of course, we do offer internship positions, but again, uh, it seems, uh, and I would agree with you that we hire people uh, of immense talent and expertise. And so often, you know, there is a, is a level of experience that is required before hire, being hired on at the city. But we are making every effort to do so when, when appropriate and also to ensure that our staff reflects the demographics of our population. And I'd like to Paul Mitchum or, Sh or Sherry Lichterman to please respond as well, who, who would like to start. And then uh, I think you've uh, uh, provided uh, most of the uh, background, but just to add that we have recently completed a very thorough EDI review of our hiring practice. Uh, and we are in the process of implementing all of those recommendations. Uh, we presented the council, we prevent, pr presented, pardon me, uh, to, uh, to our EDI committee. Uh, and so we're moving ahead with that. And I think that will uh, move us more quickly in the direction that the candidate is recommending. I'm gonna to pass to Sherry on the question with respect to uh, vaccination status. Sure, happy to answer. Um, I think your question was whether the city was gonna be removing all COVID related restrictions for employment. And I will say right now, we are still requiring all employees to be vaccinated, including new applicants. And uh, that is based on uh, public health recommendations and for the safety of all of our employees. So at this time, there's no plans to change that, uh, but we'll com continue to monitor things and, uh, and take our recommendations from public health. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on to Charles. Charles, the floor is yours. I'm Charles Probleski. I'm your candidate for the New Blue Party of Ontario for Mississauga Aaron Mills. So brought up a, you guys brought up a lot of good points. One thing I was going to ask about, so having been somebody who took public transit a lot, uh, going to the University of Guelph, I commuted from Mississauga, I guess here Ontario, Queensway area, Winston Churchill, Blurham, Thrope area to uh, University of Guelph for a number of years. I'm just wondering, when you talk about this all-day Milton service uh, for the train, is this something that's only going to be during certain hours where you have uh, pretty much people commuting around their work schedule? Because a lot of times when you take the GO bus or the GO trains, they actually sit completely vacant. So I'm just wondering if that's factoring and if you're going to have a peak service towards the beginning of the day going both ways and then towards the end of the way going both days? Or is it going to be like the Lakeshore line where it's every 30 minutes, every hour? Yep, excellent question. I'll be really brief. Um, certainly all day, two-way means all day. Uh, and there will be a schedule put in place by Go Transit, which of course is operated by the provincial government. It won't be my schedule. Uh, if it were my schedule, we'd have this done by now. Uh, and uh, also wanted to mention that there'd be a BRT along um, Dundas Street as well that will move students going to UTM from Kipling uh, subway station. I hope that's helpful. Next question, please. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from James He, and then I will go to Nina, then Sarah, and then Greg. James, go ahead. Uh, and it's hey, like hey there, hey, hey. Um, but that's fine. Uh, I just wanted to comment about the affordable livable communities. And, uh, you know, affordability is top of mind in this election. So the Green Party, of course, has put forward uh, a full platform on addressing affordability. But one of those components is uh, living in an enjoyable, livable environment. And uh, so you, we're talking about uh, transit. And of course, transit is a major concern with um, the Green Party. And we will upload uh, some of those costs. So rather than download to the municipalities, we want to take up some of those costs, which include uh, transit infrastructure and um, uh, also the BRT. But when we talk about uh, commuting, um, you were talking about uh, people commuting from Milton to Toronto and uh, back from Toronto into Milton and, uh, and of course, uh, into Mississauga Centre. Um, we would like to see more focus on less commuting, 
less movement, more uh, a livable, workable, enjoyable community. So how is the city uh, planning around that? Uh, how is the city working towards less movement and more uh, working where you live? You know what, that is really excellent question. And I will tell you that a lot of my focus as being mayor has been on attracting a, a new investment into Mississauga. And we have had such great success even throughout COVID with new investments and creating jobs. So that bringing jobs to the people right here for the people who already live in our city um, to ensure that they can thrive. Um, and as well as our priorities on building complete communities. So I will say that when I moved to Mississauga, one of my concerns was it was not a livable, walkable city. and my goal is to make us a more livable, walkable city. And we've been uh, trying to achieve that in our downtown. And if we get that loop built along the downtown, it will open up so many avenues towards more investment um, into our downtown as well, as well, make our downtown uh, more livable and more walkable and create a sense of community. But we've been doing that in all the new communities that are being built. So on the waterfront, whether it's the Lakeview project or the Brightwater project, what we're seeing is the is the building of complete communities. These are mixed use communities, places where people can live. Yes, and in, in um, Lakeview, it's about uh, 8,000 new units. So somewhere between 16,000 and 20,000 people and as well uh, jobs. Uh, 5,000 new jobs in the Lakeview community um, and people have the opportunity to go to school there, open their business there, find recreation there. These are complete communities that are all walkable. Not true of Brightwater as well as Lakeview. Brightwater has, I think, 3,000, 5,000, 5,000 5,000, 3,000, I was right the first time, uh, 3,000 residential units plus uh, as well um, jobs being created in the neighborhood. So that is really our focus to create livable, walkable communities that are complete communities. And so I think that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. Uh, there is a little bit of a corollary on that. Of course, when we get people uh, close together, noise volume and uh, of course, um, um, pollution from cars and things like that is going to be an issue. So uh, part of a livable and enjoyable community is more support for an EV infrastructure. The Green Party will bring back incentives to purchase these vehicles, uh, including EV bikes and EV cars. Uh, and of course, even supporting the purchase of more um, EV uh, buses and transit vehicles. However, uh, the infrastructure in Mississauga, having an EV myself, has been, the charging infrastructure has been rather difficult. I live in a condo, it's almost impossible to get a fair uh, price rate. Uh, so what will the city be doing to increase EV charging infrastructure, especially when trying to make it more livable and enjoyable? Oops, you're on mute. <laughs> yep, yep, got it, got it, yep. Uh, so yes, of course, we just actually, I just opened a whole uh, right, right in the neighborhood of Sheridan College, some new EV charging stations, and we have been provided funding from the provincial government once again. Uh, we are trying to reduce the noise and reduce GHGs in our communities by buying electric buses in the future. And we are piloting uh, hydrogen fuel cell battery powered uh, buses as well. So we're trying to make a lot of progress towards achieving our climate change goals. Of course, we, like other cities, want to be uh, net zero by 2050, and we're doing everything we can at a cost of about $450 million over the next 10 years to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, moving on to Nina, then Sarah, then Greg, and then Julia. Nina, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Crombie and the team for putting this on today. It's uh, It really is great to see so many candidates uh, here today. I think the last, uh, prior to the last election, I was myself and maybe one NDP candidate showed up at City Hall to see this. So it really is great to see the turnout. Um, just to, to touch on a couple of points and um, to speak about how uh, governments can collaborate. I know, I know that we've worked together significantly on how we can reduce red tape. Um, for municipalities to help get housing built and get it built faster. And there's the, obviously there's a lot more work to do there. And just to touch on um, the, I'm just gonna to touch on the GO train. Um, we have been working tirelessly for a long time now, many years with CP Rail and with Metrolinx together with the federal government to try and get at least to start with peak time two-way 
uh, go service. Uh, unfortunately, with the pandemic hitting and ridership completely uh, down so much, it's put a hold on that. But uh, those talks are ongoing with CP Rail to get those tracks available to us uh, so that Metrolinx can get those those trains running both ways, at least in peak hour for now. We do have, as you know, in Meadowvale, that high employment zone that we had designated, uh, which makes it even more of a priority. As we know, we are a net importer of jobs, as uh, Mayor Crombie mentioned earlier. So those talks are ongoing. Uh, the province is at the table, and we will be there with the funding which is necessary when the time uh, is right, and when we can get everything put in place, and obviously get our ridership back up as people continue to go back to work. Um, but just to touch also on, we've made significant investments and we'll continue to do so and listen to the communities and municipalities where long-term care needs to be built. As you know, there's been significant, massive investments. We did promise 30,000 new beds and we're well on our way to about 35,000 new beds being built with about 24,000 uh, refurbished beds as well. And many of them coming to us right here in Mississauga. So I'm really proud of that. And of course, the, one of my great, uh, the great projects is we're finally rebuilding Mississauga Hospital. It is crumbling. It has had so many band-aid solutions in the past from all governments. I'm not blaming just the previous government, but it's time now to have a full rebuild there with the long-term care center right next to it, which uh, Trillium will be supporting, which is it's great. And of course, seniors housing. Uh, we're, we're getting older. We, we're People are looking for ways to sell their home, but they need to know when they're older and there's just a couple or one person left in their home, uh, where do they go? So having that independent seniors living, not necessarily a nursing home, not necessarily a um, long-term care home, but maybe just uh, to be able to get out the very large homes into a smaller, easier home. So these are some of the things that I think um, working together with the city and of course the government's always, always open to listening to areas of how we can reduce red tape, make it easier for everyone at all levels of government to work together. And the end result, of course, is to, to help the constituents and you know just one of the priorities uh, not priorities but one of the things i'm very proud of is the tax that was being put upon people on the license plate stickers has now gone and putting the money back in your pockets so remind to everyone you still have to renew your license plates and thank, you. thank you thank you Nita. i'm just i'm just looking at the interest of time here did you have a question or no, oh, I just just want to make those comments. yeah thank no you. thank you nina and i just want to make a few comments as well so getting housing built together so important that we work collaboratively um and all processes can be improved at the province at the city at the federal government as well you know i know that the development community is frustrated but at the same time they don't have the right to build what they want where they want when they want you know there, there is a process involved because of course they're just going to buy up industrial land and try and put housing there. Um, all day two way, I thank you for the work that you've done with CP Real. It is so important that we open up this corridor at least at peak times, as you have mentioned. But then all day long when we can. The hospital, thank you so much. State of the art, innovate innovation hospital, um, and I think 22 stories, 950 beds. I think it's 1.3 million square feet. It's massive. It'll be the largest hospital in Canada and one of the largest in North America. America. However, there is a community component required, and that is very onerous for municipalities, quite frankly. We have to build those hospitals uh, by the provincial government. Healthcare is provincial responsibility, and to lay on a, a community share on municipalities could bankrupt some municipalities. So that is very important to, to realize as well. People being overhoused, it is very true. Of course, our seniors want to retire in their homes, uh, but yet they have four beautiful, large, four bedroom homes and they're you know they're empty nesters and and seniors and we encourage we need to build more stock of housing variety and format uh, to incentivize seniors to move their large homes into smaller homes or into towns or stacked towns or condos or duplexes to, to move them through so they could accommodate younger families so lots to uh, lots to to be considered and I just wanted to correct something I said to Gregory um, the uh, FCEB uh, pilot project projects is being funded. The, the, we are purchasing 10 FCEB buses um, as a pilot project and it's being funded by the federal government. Thank you. And over to our next and perhaps last question, Rob. Sarah, go ahead. Thank you very much. Sorry, I did miss that. I didn't know if you were muted or something. Um, I was. Apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Perks of technology. 
Um, I just wanted to thank Mayor Crombie for hosting this forum. The city of Mississauga is doing great work. You guys are fantastic. This is a great opportunity for us to engage with you. Fun and unfortunate that more representation is in here, inclusive of my um, conservative candidate within the Mississauga Center riding, who is one of our oppositional candidates. Um, but again, it's great forum to have community engagement and to hear that feedback on your end and at large of what the city of Mississauga wants. The question I have is more in regards to municipal elections. I know they're coming up at the end of the year. Now you outlined a number of different concerns and strategies and investment within certain areas. Now do you feel any of that will shift as we enter into the municipal election and post election? Um, will there be a shift in terms of the seats and objectives? Um, if you could just elaborate upon all that. Thank you. Um, these are our, our ongoing priorities. They're very similar to many of the municipalities right across Ontario. Uh, you know, housing affordability is common everywhere. Investment in transit and infrastructure is common. Um, certainly our deficit spending uh, uh, and and a commitment to looking at long-term sustainable revenue tools for us. Those are common. And of course, every municipality has their specific asks and those I've tried to outline for you today. Um, it, there is an opportunity for us to respond to all questions. Unfortunately, we only allotted one hour of our time and I've tried to make my responses fulsome so uh, you can have the benefit of uh, all information available. But if you type in your question or email your question to us, um, we will happily respond to you. Um, what, which email are we using, Mississauga Matters or my... Mississauga Matters at Mississauga.ca. Mississauga Matters at Mississauga.ca. Or if you want to email the mayor's office, I'm happy to respond to it directly. Mayor at Mississauga.ca. I know that uh, many of you wanted to get a question in and I wanted to give fulsome responses. So I apologize if you didn't get your chance. I know that this session could have gone on two or three hours. And I thank uh, all those representatives, candidates for joining us today. And we do have representation from almost every party. And I think that was pretty incredible. So I think I'm supposed to wrap. Is that right? Uh, it's your call, Madam Mayor, if you'd like to. <laughs> if I'd like to. Okay. Well, do we have room for one more question or not? We do. We started a, a little bit late. so we. All can, right. Given that we, we started a little late, let's accommodate at least one more question, please. Yes. Just give me one moment while I call up the panelists here. Our next question is from uh, Greg Vesna, and then Julia Cole was our last question. So, Greg, go ahead. Let's try and accommodate both. Thank you. I think we may have lost Greg, uh, unfortunately. Um, so our next question comes from uh, Julia. Julia, go ahead. Julia, we're having difficulties unmuting you at the moment. I don't know why. There we go. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, my internet is being really dodgy right now, so I was missing that. Um, so just wanted to give, yes, a quick thanks, and I know we're running out of time, and my fellow candidates have uh, pretty much stolen all of my questions, but any last thoughts um, from anyone on the panel on what the most effective uh, and you know appropriate approach is going to be for communication and collaboration between municipal government and provincial? How can we support each other? Um, you know, how can we support our staff and how can we work most efficiently for the people of our city? You know, it's a great question and communication is always challenging. We have set up information sessions and I know that Nina has been part of them in the past and we thank you for your attendance, Nina. She diligently has come to many of them and we need the provincial, our provincial partners at the table when we have information sessions like this one to brief you on our priorities or ahead of pre-budget when we have pre-budget uh, submissions to talk about our priorities. Um, and it's so important that you attend. Um, so, you know, we keep the lines of communication open uh, all government members can have my contact information and everyone here at City Hall. And we just need to meet more regularly and communicate more often and more effectively so that we can be informed when you change legislation at the province and what our demands are here at the city. So I think that's going to wrap us up. I hope that was adequate. Are there any other questions? I see another none of the above candidates on the uh, call. Please let, please let uh, Greg Vesna know that we did turn to him and he has left the call. 
um, that if you know what his question is, I'm happy that you ask it, Len. And if not, I will wrap. All right, not seeing anyone. I'm going to wrap, and I really want to thank everyone for coming out today. It's so important, and I was so de delighted that we had representation from every party. I want to thank you, all your candidates. I know how hard it is to work uh, out, out there and knock on doors and make those calls. I want to thank members from our community and particularly my city staff for joining us for today's uh, session. I hope you found it informative. I hope I didn't uh, give too fulsome responses. I just wanted to be sure you were well briefed and well informed. And I hope that if elected, you're going to put Mississauga priorities at the forefront of your mandate. Uh, I encourage everyone on the call to get out and vote uh, and by either participating in our advance polls or voting on election day on June 2nd, your voice does matter. Um, so everyone on the call, notwithstanding your candidates, you'll be voting presumably for yourselves, but whoever you vote for, make sure you make put uh, Mississauga priorities first of that on top of that ballot front and center. And if you're looking for more information about our priorities, please visit mississaugamatters.ca. Thank you once again uh, for joining us and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I'm sure you're all eager to get back and knock on more doors. Thank you. <laughs>